500 mile hike. And Martha and Gabriel, would you please come up and tell us about that?
So pilgrimage um, and, and the celebration of St. James was a very big thing in the Middle Ages. The Templars came to protect the pilgrims, and I love Templars. And um, they carried a shell. This is a shell. And every pilgrim gets one in St. John Pied de Port where you sign up and get a credential. This is proof that you are on the Camino. Every night you check into your albergue or hotel, they stamp it and date it. When you get to uh, Santiago, then you get your credential. Or your certificate, your Compostela. when a man named Paul Coelho wrote a book called The Pilgrimage. And it was a magical, mystical tour about a man who was looking for enlightenment and was told to go from his home in Brazil to Spain to travel the Camino, and he would certainly find enlightenment. It struck a chord with people all over the world. Korea, Japan, Australia. People started traveling to the Camino to see what was actually going on. And yeah, the, the throng, there were throngs. About 20 some years later, another novel was written, and then a movie was produced, it was called The Way. And um, I saw it three, three Thanksgivings ago. And I said, I really have to do that. I don't know why, I don't know what's in store for me, but I have to do it. And so I was talking to Gabrielle, and she became infected with the idea. <laughs> but she said, I don't camp, and I'm not going to stay in a room <laughs> with 20 or more people I don't know. <laughs> so that was the beginning of the Charlemagne option. <laughs> we had private rooms with private baths. And our luggage was toted from city to city. <laughs> now, Gabrielle's going to give you an idea of day in the life of a peregrino, which I started calling Pellegrino. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm not, supposed, I'm not supposed to apologize, and Gabrielle's not supposed to complain. Those were the two rules we made for one another. <laughs> slideshow that's just going to run, it's sort of in chronological order, sort of not, it's kind of just the entire experience, kind of uh, day by day. Um, I'm also going to mostly read this, there's so much to say that I'm sure I would just get off on some weird tangent and you'd never hear the whole story, so I apologize for reading. Um, so on September, from September 19th, October 22nd, Martha and I were pilgrims, or peregrinos, but as Martha called us, pilgrims. And um, we were part of a large cohort of travelers looking for the spiritual and physical challenges of the Camino. So we left Saint-Jean-Pierre de Port for, on September 19th for Roncevalles, Spain. That was a 15-mile um, hike, 45 feet up and 16 feet down. It took us 12 hours. It usually takes eight. We're pretty slow. But we got there, and believe me, we were just really upset to find out that there's 20 more steps up to the hotel. But, and we did it. So this climb is so challenging that most uh, pilgrims have their packs transported to Roncevalles, but since we were on the Charlemagne option, as um, Martha said, we had our packs picked up every day. Um, that we did carry day packs every day with water and things we were afraid to lose, um, including like iPads and things. So this was not really much of a primitive event. So, um, so we, the, um, 
the room, the, the buildings where people stayed were 12, 20 people to a room are called albergues, and they grew out of the tradition of pilgrims being housed by um, the local villages and churches. So, but now they're cheap and plentiful, offering more traditional pilgrims, not on the Charlemagne option, the flexibility of stopping for the night whenever they felt like it or needed to. They could get a bed for five to eight euros. Um, but life on the commune was very simple. We only had to do two things every day. One was get our packs to the lobby by eight o'clock so they wouldn't miss the transport company. And the next thing we had to do was walk. That was it. We usually walked 12 to 15 miles a day with a few longer ones thrown in. We also had a couple of vehicular assist days. Most days our alarm would go off at seven and we'd check email, Facebook, sometimes call home. And um, then we would take care of our feet, probably the most important thing we did every day, and to no avail most of the time. Pack up our stuff and go out to look for breakfast. We usually found it in a bar. Bars in Spain um, serve alcohol and breakfast. And um, we usually had a cafe con leche and a croissant. Sometimes Spanish tortilla, which is kind of like potato frittata. Uh, we also could follow the um, whoever the purveyors to these cafes were, like just the size and the style of the croissant. Most of them weren't that good, some of them were huge. <laughs> there were towns about every three miles and usually several bars in each. The bar closest to the outskirts of the city always got the most business because you never wanted to take the chance that there was not another one further in the town. <laughs> so, but we never wanted for anything. We met a lot of people at these um, cafes and we were always stopping for coffee and lunch or snacks. Paths are pretty well marked, but this was uh, this is really dependent on which state is caring for the path. There does not seem to be one organization that is in charge of the community. You can get your credentials in a variety of places, not just in the credential office in um, Saint Jean. Uh, who knows? I mean, the fact that you can actually get your credentials stamped in a bar is pretty cool. Um, and traditionally, you got stamped in the church. Most of the churches are closed. Um, during the day. I mean, I think they're open on Sundays. So, um, the universal symbol of the Camino was the yellow arrow, which I have this little yellow arrow pin here, which I got. Um, the yellow arrow was painted on sidewalks, trees, stone walls, signposts, and the sides of buildings. So we got really good at spotting them. You could almost feel one around the corner, just especially if you really wanted to find one to make sure that you were going the right way. Sometimes uh, cities were really tricky. So the first third of the trip was hilly and mountainous, the second third is relatively flat farmland, and the last third was over two more mountain ranges, though none of them liked the Pyrenees. It was never a day without something to climb. We measured um, climbing um, by the number of Ken driveways or by Coleman Valley Road. And um, we came up to a hill about the middle of the trip that looked to be about eight Ken driveways. And we're just going, oh, God. Okay. Morning, uh, and I'm in a good mood, and I'm feeling really energetic, and I just head up the hill, and I couldn't stop. If I stopped, I probably wouldn't get started again, so I just cleared the thing. I was up there, it was just so cool. You get to the top, this fabulous view, and then Martha is coming up behind me, and she has figured out how to breathe and, and with her stride so that she never got tired going up, she never stopped. She got up there that stopping as well. After that, hills were hard, but not daunting. Um, it was never boring. I was afraid I would be bored getting up doing the same thing every day. But every day was new. The terrain landscape was different. The colors were always changing. It was past harvest, so there were, the fields were all being plowed. They grow rocks in Spain. Um, that's pretty much it. And, um, and sunflowers that they don't harvest, and hay that they harvest, but they don't use. Um, you know, you know about agriculture, it's just like the U.S. So um, there's lots of beautiful different colors of browns and greens. I also became obsessed with these huge stacks of hay bales that were left to rot in the fields. And with the bright gold foam that was sprayed on the sides of old buildings to protect them from the elements during renovation. The building styles changed throughout the trip. We traveled through impossibly charming towns where every building was white stucco with sport window boxes filled with pink and red geraniums. We walked on paths covered with pine needles through beautiful forests, across stunning rural landscapes and over incredibly green mountains. We walked on Roman roads that connected centuries-old towns where all the buildings were constructed of stone and through large and small cities. 
We loved the larger cities. Each had a new city and an old city. And um, we especially loved Pamplona and Leon. When we called in, we were in Burgos, which is the other big city up there. We didn't like that. Um, we don't know why exactly, but we just didn't. We walked on over 50 types of surfaces. You'll see in the pictures of my feet with the different, um, different um, road surfaces under them. Um, there's majority of the group was dirt track with rocks about the size of eggs plus all the different styles of tiles in the cities, concrete, asphalt, gravel, mud to step to your shoes and making them weigh 10 pounds each. Dirt tracks with much bigger rocks and ones that were just solid rock, totally solid rock. Very slippery when wet. We wore out our shoes. I wore out my heels, they were numb for weeks. Martha and I had different daily rhythms. I had energy in the morning and tended to walk faster then. She was usually in the lead in the afternoon. Neither one of us is much for chit-chat, so we could walk in the silence for hours with only the occasional, hey, look at the beautiful stone wall, or how many more kilometers? And Martha always had the answer about the kilometers, because she was the keeper of the map. She was actually the leader. Some days were easy, cool weather, no difficult climbs, and some were awful. When our legs got too tired, we would drag ourselves up the hills with our poles. Our best day was after climbing several good-sized hills. We found ourselves walking along a beautiful ridge on asphalt with wonderful views and no one else around. It was later afternoon and it was just beautiful. It was so peaceful and wonderful. It's the day we always remember. Um, the last hour of any day was the hardest, whether we talked, walked 12 miles or 18 miles. We always thought we should be there sooner than we actually got there. There were kilometer markers along the way, and all the guidebooks would tell you the distances between towns. They were all optimistic. <laughs> we thought we knew what 12 miles was, but in Spain it was always longer. I think they measured differently. So we made some rules. You aren't at the top until you're at the top. This was a big problem, because if you kept going up, and you turn, and you go, ah, I see it, there's light there, and then next thing you know, there's another 500 feet. And you weren't there until you saw the hotel. Finding the hotel was part of the misery of the last hour. <laughs> Maps and the books were not that good um, when you got into cities. But we found that um, the way we felt about each town we stayed in was all about how we were greeted. We stayed in a $300 a uh, night paradors and $35 a night hostels. Even the, you know, often the cheaper ones felt better because we were greeted and made to feel welcome by the owner by someone with a stake and making you comfortable and keeping their trip advisor and bookings.com ratings high. We were met in a parador at the, which is this big expensive hotels. They take the old palaces and commons and turn them into luxury hotels. And we were met at the um, reception by somebody on her cell phone who never got off it. So, I don't know, they trained in the US. <laughs> Price was no guarantee of comfort. Most of the beds were like sleeping on compacted newspapers. Money did not help us. Once we got to our hotel, we'd shower, do laundry, rest, read, nap. About 6.30 or 7, we'd go out to find dinner. It was always a pilgrim meal. Pilgrim meals were called that because of the style of the food and because they were served early. Spaniards don't even start eating until 9, and we were usually in bed by then. Um, so the pilgrim meal was a three-course fixed-price meal that cost about $13. They were always 10 euros. The value of the euros that we bought in the U.S. before we left was going down while we were there. We had really, well, we were hoping it would go up and we would be making out, but we actually did it the other way. But, um, but that was good in the U.S. So you're, the, the meal would be a char of starter, which was ensalada mista, which here sounds like a really nice green salad, and there it was lettuce and uh, sometimes some sliced eggs, sliced tomatoes, some olives, and then a chunk of canned tuna in the middle. Actually, it was big enough for us for a meal, but uh, um, we just ended up sharing usually often um, just one of these meals because there was way too much food. So also, you could choose potato salad, soup, or a pasta with sauce that seemed to be watered on ketchup. Now, you see, I'm not really complaining. I'm just describing <laughs> was always meat with french fries. The meat was usually three pan-fried slices, about this big, 
They, um, no matter what you ordered, pork, chicken, beef, lamb, they all tasted the same. <laughs> Not bad. Dessert was usually a choice of um, ice cream, if you could call it that, in a cup, flan, yogurt, or fruit, plus all the wine you could drink. On the last day of the trip, everyone takes a detour to a point that overlooks Santiago. This was the first time that the end was in sight. We can see the huge cathedral with its three spires, two of them um, um, covered in scaffolding. All the churches in Spain on this trip are being remodeled. We would go to a small, tiny village and there'd be a huge crane in there. You didn't even know how they got there. You could barely get there. And they were just, I don't know where the money's coming from. I don't know what it's all about because Spain is not in very good shape economically. We all know the Catholic Church is always in good shape, so maybe that's it. I can make Catholic jokes. Um, so, when we went out to look at the, at the view of Santiago, I was hoping, but I'd seen this in the movie, that it's like they came up and there was this hill, and um, behind them was Santiago, and I was really looking forward to this and hoping it wasn't done with a blue screen. But <laughs> it turned out that it really was there, but it was a big tourist spot, and so having the inspirational moment was really, um, not something that we had because there were so many Irish tourists out there. So they were having a good time. We arrived in Santiago about three hours later after walking through half the city and as usual wondering if we would ever get there. Finally we came around the corner and there was the plaza and the huge cathedral. We looked at each other, hugged, said, oh, okay, we're here. Let's go get our Campostella. And that's the certificate that we just showed you. So later on we talked to other people. We thought this was so weird, you know, it's like in the movies, everybody's jumping down, up and down, they're high-fiving, they're just really all excited. There was one woman there who was jumping up and down, but we didn't do that. But um, a lot of other people had the same um, reaction. It really wasn't that we really didn't get the um, expected euphoria of completing a difficult task, but it was just an acknowledgement that the journey was over, because in the end, it was all about the journey. Now we have a little time for questions. Right. Was the hotel room at the really hard bed and everything, was that better than camping? It's always better than camping. <laughs> <laughs> there's a bathroom. Yes. You can leave your toothbrush on the sink. It's really nice. Um, we just band yeah. There's blister bandages and lots of ball skin. And wow. One of the things that um, you put Vaseline on your feet so they got a little more slippery inside the socks. I had, I wore socks that had toes in them because I get blisters between my toes often and then another pair on top of that. But they were so thick that I started cutting the toes out of some of them because they were just making it too thick on one foot. So just things like that, everybody figured out something didn't take good care of them, your feet could get infected, and that people who had that problem, and it was, he was in the hospital for several days, so, I don't know. And you know, we, we worked at, at um, getting our feet in shape. We, we worked for a long time before, and you know, the first day, we both got posters. It was amazing, and they didn't go away for a long time, but then they did, and a week before we got to Santiago, we have blisters again. It was just unbelievable. Our last day of walking was the only day I didn't have uh, band-aids on my feet. <laughs> you have one memorable moment in the whole trip. Uh, there were several, some of them were just accomplishments of getting up really awful hills. There was one that was mud and huge rocks and it was straight up and it was pouring rain, and this is the real dragging yourself up. We were so cold and tired. We got to the top, and it's like, wow, that was cool. You know, and this one where we were on top of the bridge, that was just a beautiful day. Yeah, and there was really only one bad day, and we, it was called Tio Pepe's. And it, what you would think, we went in and it was filthy. But we had nowhere else to go because we were in the middle of nowhere. So 
we checked into our room. Um, we didn't want to touch anything. We went in the bathroom and decided that we would brush our teeth out in the fields. And um, so we went downstairs for dinner. And just below where the bathrooms were was the bar. And just above the bar was a metal plate. And the metal plate had water dripping from the bathroom <laughs> and the bar. So we couldn't wait to get out of there. That was the only one, though. The rest were all pretty wonderful. Did you, did you have to drink a bottle of water, or did you drink water? No, the water. They, all, there were fountains all along the way, and they were marked on the map. And they had these food. And it would say if it was potable or not. And there was lots of bottled water. There were bars everywhere. Would you recommend it, and how would you, how would you change? I would recommend, I think Gabrielle and I won't agree on this, <laughs> but I would recommend taking hardly anything and not making reservations, and not staying in albergues with public rooms for sleeping, but staying in private hotels. But I wouldn't make reservations, and I'd be more flexible. How would you change? That was how I'd change. No, it wasn't how you change. Oh, how did I change? I don't know. You don't call <laughs> <laughs> We just use, for me, what I do is I, uh, if something is hard and I don't want to do it, I just think about the eight Ken Hill and ten driveway hill, and then I go, well, okay, fine, I can do this. And those are sort of more of the lessons I think. Some people have real spiritual awakenings, but they don't call it. And, uh, and, but we didn't. We just more went through the physical challenge. And um, on the Camino, you saw the hill, the big mound with the cross on top. Those rocks are from people who carried a stone from home. It was filled with their worries, with their troubles, and they left them on the hill. I forgot the rock. <laughs> so I just symbolically left it. But it is a place when I wake up in the middle of the night and I wonder how I'm going to do something or how I'm going to pay a bill for the store. I put that on the hill and I go back to sleep. And that's how I've changed. I, I worry a lot less. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you.